Open my eyes that I might see. Glimpses of truth thou hast for me. Place in my hand the wonderful key that shall unclasp and set me free. Silently now I wait for thee. Ready, my God, thy will to see. Open my eyes, illumine me, Spirit divine. Amen. Just an act of extraordinary imagination before we bring the message for the evening. So we have great power and we have commandeered the airways, both the major networks and also the cables and the entire internet. And with the brief space we have purchased so that every American citizen would hear the gospel one time, can you imagine how these words, which we just heard, and we've already read the gospel, but I just want to just, I mean, think about the nation, Americans listening to this gospel. But I say to you that listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. Can you imagine? They're listening out there. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also and from anywhere, anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Republicans are listening. Democrats are listening. The rich, the poor, black, white, Latino, Native Americans, Asians, they are listening. Give to everyone who begs from you, and if anyone takes away from you your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. Uh, you get the point, but let me just, I mean, since we still have national coverage, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. I mean, listen. Love your enemies, do good and lend. Expect nothing in return. <sighs> Be merciful, just as your father is merciful. So I, I thought it was important enough to take a minute of my limited time for talking, just to let America hear what the gospel says to those of us in here. They would think it weird to do they believe that? Do they expect to live by that? Do they measure us according to that standard? Well, okay, so that was just a commercial before I begin my sermon. <laughs> Forty-eight years ago, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., a prophet to the nation, slain, Hotel Balcony, Motel Lorraine. I was on my way to Virginia Commonwealth University. I was doing chaplaincy training there at the time. When the news was flashed, I teared up 
feared for my safety crossing the Marshall Street Bridge, but I made it over. By the way, that bridge has been torn down and there's a new bridge in Richmond called the Martin Luther King Bridge. I got to the parking lot and I, I sat there for a while with my hands on the steering wheel and I said, Martin, you shall not have died in vain. That's been a long time ago. Things have changed. I mean, back then, in the 60s, it wasn't an ideal time. I, I recall that actually January 11th, 1961, the first day I had an opportunity to go to the Woolworth Five and Dime to buy a hot dog with mustard and relish and ketchup and a big orange. But when I entered for the first time since before then, my kind had to buy their sandwich at the window. When I got in, the lady that was sitting next to me got up and ran out of the store. And I cannot remember, even now, whether I ever ordered my hot dog with mustard and ketchup and relish and whether I ordered that big orange. What I do remember is that I um, went home, sat down, and this is what I wrote. Why did she move when I sat down? Surely she could not tell so soon that my Saturday bath had worn away or that savage passion had pushed me for a rape. Perhaps it was the cash she carried in her purse. She could not risk a theft so early in the month and who knows that on tomorrow twould fall her lot to drink her coffee from a cup my darkened hands had clutched. So horrible was that moment I too surprised run away for prejudice has the odor of a dying beast whether rapist or racist both fall in the savage class and the greatest theft of all is to rob one's right to be the reason I remembered it is because the lady who ran out of the store was a white woman but Thirty years later, a white woman at the Riverside Church, where I was then serving as pastor, brought me that poem and said, Jim, I was going through some of my papers, papers, and I, I saw this poem you sent me. The reason I sent it to her was because Dorothy Marcus, whom we call Pete Hampton in those days, was working at the United Church on Hillsborough Street in Raleigh, North Carolina, and she was organizing efforts to bring black kids to her church for tutoring and for recreation and for some inspiration towards trying to be the best that we could be. Isn't that interesting? One white woman ran away. Another drew us so much so until I said to myself, if, if she only knew how badly this hurts me, and she would feel as strongly about it as I do. So that's why I sent her the letter. But guess what that did for me? It made it impossible ever again for me to put all people in one basket. Some run and some invite. And people have to make their choices. It's been a long time since that time and other things have happened you know, um, oh, since that time, I've had a chance to remember um, the year, the next year. I'm serving as a student intern at Olin T. Binkley Memorial Baptist Church in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. During the absence of Dr. Seymour, I was in charge of the church. 
Mrs. Burke Adams gave birth to a beautiful child, and as the pastor in charge, I went to the hospital to bring greetings and to offer good wishes for her new child. And the nurse says, you must be in the wrong section. Um, the, the, the colored maternity award is d over, d down there. I said, well, no, I'm here to, here to visit Mrs. Adams. Yes, but, but your award, there's a new baby, it's with you. you. No, no, Mrs. Adams, I, I, I'm, I, I'm working at the church there. She was embarrassed, but finally let a black man walk into the white maternity ward to offer the blessing of Christ for a white baby. That was in 62. Things have happened. I just recently went back to Chapel Hill and we had just a wonderful time of remembering. And since I mentioned Chapel Hill, you should know that I've asked someone to give me a warning when my time is up. Carolina and Villanova are coming up later, and I understand all. Of the, I understand all about. The, so, 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 don't worry. Don't, don't worry. I, I'm starting off slow, but I got somebody to tell me, hey, for whatever else you have to say, see if you can get another invitation to come back and finish it up. Then, all right, all right. All right. Yeah. In the next year, 63, things happen. I mean, we had an opportunity to worship at St. Paul's Episcopal Church, where now they are debating what to do about Robert E. Lee's portrait pictures, but the stained glass windows, and they've made their decision to kind of meet halfway. They're taking things down. They're not going to change the stained glass windows. Princeton isn't really sure how they're going to work it out, but things have changed, y'all. Oh, I'm just so proud right now. It just April the 1st, Friday, I had the opportunity to offer the invocation for the investiture of Judge LaShawn D.R.C. Hall, who is now a federal judge of the Eastern New York Federal Court. She was appointed a black sister, having, having, having worshiped at Riverside, wanted her pastor emeritus to come to be a part of that. She was, the, she was, she was uh, nominated by President Obama, confirmed after some wrangling. Wrangling seems to be a pattern confirmed by confirmed by the Congress and uh, oh and her daughter, a young black girl, eight or nine years old, held the Bible. But all of her classmates from Chapin were there on the floor. Only two or three black girls in that class, but the rest of them will be able to look at this black girl and say, mm -mm -mm, your mommy is a federal judge. Things have changed. But, um, but April 4th, 1968 was a day of death. During that time, death seemed to hound my trail somehow. In fact, I try to avoid it, Brother Zepp. Uh, in clinical training, they finally give you a chance to go to the morgue. That day, I um, found some excuse, some pastoral duty kept me away. I don't like death. So I'm trying to avoid death. But then the next day, we go to Grand Rounds where Dr. Lowry had been performing transplants of hearts. We theologians in training asked him, Dr. Lowry, tell us when a person is a donor in a heart transplant operation, is the patient that's giving the heart up really dead? To which he responds, in the hospital, our work proceeds according to clinical definitions 
when a person has come in from an accident, major accident, many, many systems in the body have failed. We have a list of vital signs that we are required by law to check. After we have checked these standards, if we discover that even though the person may still have brain waves, should this person live would be basically kind of like a vegetable that there is in this case no longer a prospect for meaningful purposeful human existence we can declare that the person is clinically dead and that heart can be used i thought i escaped the morgue but here i am it's over in church hill all oh, most of the people I served, given the deprivation occasioned by the poverty in which they were living, the absence of quality health care, absence of good education, lack of decent wages, the absence of safety in the streets, fear for what the police might do should they come, generalized desperation to live. I thought I can't get away. I didn't go to the morgue, but I'm working in a situation where there seems to be no prospect for meaningful, purposeful human existence. I guess we had to stamp the community clinically dead. It was about that time that the ministry that I guess I'll have two or three minutes to share with you about, it, it came clear to me that this, the Bible has anticipated this kind of thing. That, that in Ezekiel 37, in the valley of the dry bones, the Spirit takes me by the hand and leads me around the valley, and it is full of bones, and they are dry, yea, they are very dry. It was then that I accepted this assignment the ministry of raising the dead. That is to say, the calling to preach the gospel. The calling to follow Dr. King, who was now dead, and to whom I had promised, you shall not have died in vain, gives me a responsibility not to run from the morgue, not to avoid the reality of death in many places, but to recognize that indeed, God's love for God's people requires that there be somebody somewhere who is willing to rise up in the face of the death of social, economic, and political, and dehumanizing patterns of life. Somebody somewhere has to be willing to rise up and say, Dr. King, they killed you, the dreamer. But we have an obligation, an obligation to say, you did not die in vain, nor did the Christ whose name we bear, he did not die in vain. We who are alive as long as possible for us, we will proclaim a living word of hope in the midst of death and not hope for pie in the sky by and by, but on earth as it is in heaven. We are called upon to do so. That's why I'm happy to spend the death date. You know, they mess up the birthday. I have a dream. They mess up. Oh, that's about all you can hear. But on the death date, the question has to be raised. What are we going to do about situations of death and when you ask that question, it means I'd better at least turn to say, there's death in the land. You listen to the news. They're not listening to that gospel we read earlier. There's death in the land. There's a lot of it. Let me, let, let, let me mention one or two evidences of this thing, man. Listen, right now, in good old USA, they are powerful forces which are working day and night.
to undermine, undermine commitment to respect for others, undermine commitment to the gospel word, to the golden rule. There are forces who are working to undermine the commitment to the common good, care for the needy, responsibility for the environment, respect for our leaders and the positive function that government can sometimes play. There are forces undermining the recognition of the limitations of military might. Oh, brothers and sisters, there are forces out there daily trying to recruit us to live by standards of greed, indifference to our neighbors, individualism, xenophobic tribalism, arrogant exceptionalism, the denial of reality in preference for illusions and wishful thinking of greatness that can be spun just out of the air just because we said it. Folks, there's death in the land. And on King's death date, we got to ask, what are we going to do about the death in the land? Oh, there was death in the time of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel and, and the people had generally abandoned their covenant commitment. They were seeking the comforts and conveniences that would come from lining up with the status quo. There was death in terms of a broken covenant relationship. Something had to be done. An effort was made on Mount Carmel and it was once again declared that God, the Yahweh, that, jo that, 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 that Joseph served, that Jacob and, and Abraham and Sarah and Rebecca, that, 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 that's God, but the people have not changed their ways. You can pull down the flag, but the flagpole still remains. And also the image and the patterns and the values are still intact. And at the time that there was death in the land, there's an unfortunate situation. How much time have I had? <laughs> when there was death in the land, God's servant was asleep, lying down under a juniper tree, having despaired. I can't handle this. In fact, it is enough, O oh Lord. Now take away my... I, I can't handle this stuff. And he runs out of steam and his gotten up he just he just can't go anymore so he's 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 well he lacks a prospect of meaningful purposeful human existence but that's good news the good news is that when god asked elijah to go on this mission there was a contract established I think it's the same contract that God established with all of us. It's kind of a three-point contract. Ho, go, and low. Ho means God gets our attention. Get through you. I want you to be a reflection of what's in my heart. I want you to be an agent of transformation. I, 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 do I have your attention? Will you go? Will you do it? Yeah. So ho is a part of it. And then go, go. If you know what, what my love is, if you know what my justice and righteousness demand, go, you, I'm, I'm appointing you. I, I, I want you to be the light. I want you to be the salt. I, I want you to be the instruments of peace and love and justice and compassion. You go, but it always had low. Low, I am with you. Always. I, I, I'm not going to say ho and go and not say low. Lo, I, I'm with you if you'll do this job. I, I'll be with you no matter what. So though, e Zeke, though Elijah is dead, 
the low kicks in. And that's really all I really wanted to talk to you about. Even if my time is up, it's all right. The point is, I want you to know that, that the God who said low is here tonight. That the God who said low is ready to enable us to do what we have to do to confront the death that's in the land through the gospel that may be hard to be heard. But nevertheless, the low of God's presence is God's faithfulness. That's God, God's faithfulness. That, that, that's still operating. So even if you're down, so I want, I tell you what, I'm going to give chance now for, uh, e Elijah to tell you what happened to him. Then I'll tell you what happened to me. And then I know my time will be up. <laughs> Elijah said, though dead, God's low kicked in. I couldn't take anything. NPO, nothing by mouth. So I was fed intravenously. God sent the angels to feed me. Just, just to feed me. I, I couldn't even enjoy it. Didn't have an appetite for it. Didn't know I was getting it. But God, God nourished me. Thank God for nurses. So we all like to praise the surgeon, but thank God for the nurse that hooks it up. We don't know what's going on. Keeps us alive. It gives us a vital connection to possibility. But then he said something happened. One of those times when he woke up, it says, eat man. Because the journey, eat man, the journey is going to be too. Journey? I thought we were at the journey's end. I thought it was all over. I thought I'd given my best shot. I thought I was, I thought I was on the way to retirement from this thing. No, 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 no. There's a journey. That, that, that is a task that's waiting to be fulfilled and you're going to do it. Get up. He got up, went up. The Lord said, I'm going to show myself to you so that you can get your energy back together. You, you, your get up and go has gotten up and gone, but it's coming back. I'm, I, I'm going to show myself to you. So he gets up. For those of us who wait now to figure out what we're going to do for this country, we've got to recognize that God's fascinating. That God, you know, you can't put God in a box. You, you, you cannot anticipate exactly how God is going to do it or through whom it will be done. You won't know that. You really won't know that. So what happens is that, that he says, God, I, I got up waiting to see God. There was earthquake. There was wind. There was fire. But God did not manifest at that point. And then he said, and this is the, this is the high point of the sermon. I used to take the liberty to come down from the pulpit. Th this is too important to say here. So you, this is okay? Is it, uh, He said that God did not give a manifestation through earthquake, wind, or fire because the mission was too great. Uh, a manifestation might not be enough. So what God did is that God gave God's self so imperceptibly that you did not hear a sound. It was a sound of sheer silence. And the reason it's a sound of sheer silence is because it was not that God had to come from way up there not because the tongues of fire had to dance, but because when God said lo, it was an intimation that I am in you where I've always been since the dawn of creation. For I made you in my image. And when I made you in my image, I insinuated myself in your genome, your very DNA, in the image and likeness I'm in there. You've just grown dim with the awareness of it. So I don't have to come one way out there. You don't even need to make a sound if you dare to believe that in your humanity, 
I am so powerfully be present that if you can be in resonance with what I have placed deepest in you, you will do justice. You will love mercy. You will walk humbly and you will transform the very nation. You will be a part of the resurrecting of a dead nation so that democracy has a chance to live again. Which is my way liturgically of saying, let's see what we can do. If we allow the God in us to be acknowledged as having been there all along, and we join in both listening and responding to that voice, then we may be able, even during this election time, we as the church, with our colleagues, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, all of us in whom God has made residency a primary expression of love, if we could do it, we might be able to rise above the cacophony of sounds of death we might be able to give a different vision of what's possible in this nation. And what I want to recommend, Dean and President, is Pentecost is coming. Why don't we decide to make a national, well, I think Pentecostal uh, activation campaign. That's the pack we need to worry about, PAC, Pentecostal activate. That is to say, let's refuse to let Pentecost be celebrated as usual. Let's refuse to let it be churches getting together, getting streamers and stuff, and having sound effect and stuff. Let's let Pentecost be a call to the nation, to the awareness that the Spirit of God is already in us, if only we put but here. Republicans come, Democrats come, independents come, blacks, whites, gay, straight. Listen to the voice that is a voiceless presence inside you. And we got a new America coming. I know it'll happen. Let's make Pentecost a national revival occasion because that's what happened. Fire came down, manifestation, but the folks that got it, as a result of Pentecost, we had the first inkling of Jubilee justice. They started having stuff in common. They started acting like the gospel was asking us to live. Wonder what would happen if we stopped letting it be just something on the calendar and made it an event that manifested God's love. I'll, 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 keep, I'll keep alert to what you do.